Come on, y'all. We still continue on purpose call. And today I have my special friend. She is the brother of Nathan Hines who came and spoke to us in January. <laughs> Wait. I'm done. I'm done. She's the older sister. She's the only sister that is the oldest in the family. So I want you to give her a round of applause because here's why. Y'all don't know, but we had to talk her into this so much. And you don't realize, but she's got a lot of wisdom. Like, we will be spitting fire today. So I hope you're ready to take notes because today's session, we wanted to title it, Let's Get Purposeful. So if you guys will, can you give a lifestyle welcome to my friend, Mariah Hines, ladies and gentlemen. She only agreed. She's like, I'll only do this if we do like a sit down session. So I wanted her just to preach a full sermon and spit fire. She's like, I'm not doing that, Chris. That's not happening. So it's just not happening. I understand. Well, Mariah, thank you uh, for you know agreeing to this, even though we had to talk you into it. I'm going to have to buy Chick Fil A after. Um, yes. But <laughs> uh, oh, she's such, such a servant's heart. I'm not going to let you buy Chick Fil A. Uh, no, we. So me and Mariah talked the other day, and we wanted to. We asked you guys some questions, and we said, hey, we want you to submit some questions about what you have about purpose, what do you want to know about purpose, what is something that we can help you with, and uh, these are some of the questions that you guys submitted. This is also some of the things that we um, decided to uh, talk about, because I believe there's a lot of things to do with purpose, and we kind of went over that, uh, that there's a lot of things that comes into intertwining what purpose is, and how did you... Uh, achieve or reach the purpose that God wants you to obtain. How many of y'all in this room think that you have a purpose by a show of hands? <laughs> we got some hands down. We need to pray. <laughs> All right. Now, how many of y'all are like, listen, I think I have a purpose. I just don't know when I'll find it and what it's going to look like. And that's why we're having this session. So, um, so we talked, and one of the first questions that we hit was, you know, is it can your actions now affect your purpose that God has for you? So what would you say to that? I mean, yes and no, honestly. Like, I mean, God is always going to just give you grace, give you wisdom and strength for it. And it's honestly kind of on us to make a decision to move past it, repent, forgive ourselves for it. And I mean, choose to be happy. Yeah, I think one of the things that I immediately go to is if you read in the Bible, um, Saul is very much thinking what he's doing is right. And he thinks, I'm, this is my purpose before he becomes Paul. And he's thinking, this is what, what I'm doing is right. I'm standing up for the gospel. I'm standing up for God. And then all of a sudden he gets a revelation of who Jesus is and Jesus says, no, this is what I have for you. This is your purpose. And uh, I think it becomes an awakening. So I think there is things, though, um, that can affect your path um, and can affect your purpose. I think one of the major things that we um, kind of talked about is Samson. I think the most scariest thing you ever read in Scripture, scariest thing I ever read in Scripture, is when it says this in, in Judges. It says, and Samson never knew the Spirit had left him. I think it's the most scariest thing you can ever read in Scripture. Uh, so you can be living and thinking that the things you're doing now won't affect your purpose, and you think everything's all good, until the time comes where you're meeting Jesus face to face. And he says, hey, I had all this plan for you. Why did you, why did you not take the opportunities you had right in front of you? So there is things that can affect your purpose, um, and even, uh, I think the Bible would talk about that, planting bad seeds, and talking about what it means to plant a bad seed, because you reap what you sow. Um, and what do, you, what do you think when you hear that? Because that's such like an old, and we've been raised in church, so we've heard this, like, those pastors be like, you're reaping what you sow. You gotta, you gotta straighten up. It's fire and brimstone. Like, we always hear this. But, like, there's actually, like, a real profound meaning to reaping and sowing um, and what it means. What, like, what is something that you kind of discovered that what it really means to reap what you sow? I mean, it's, you reap, like, it all, I mean, it's pretty simple. Good, you do good, you treat people well, you it's like treating like someone treated you badly, but then expecting them to treat you well in return. 
Like, if you are so mean, you're bullying, you're talking down to these people, you're blasting them on social media, you're doing all of these things, but then in person, you expect them to kind of like turn their cheek and act like everything's good and be like the all besties in real life. It's just, it's not going to work. Yeah, I think, I think one of the coolest things too is like this, reaping what you sow, I hope you know, isn't that the same thing they teach you in school about physics? That every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So literally, when you reap, you're either going to reap a, a positive or a negative. But at the end of the day, you're going to, when you reap something, you're going to sow something out of it. Um, I think one of the things that we talked about though was like, uh, you know, we we uh, we all make mistakes, so we're obviously not going to reap, and we're, we're like we're going to sow bad seeds. Like we're going to just sow bad seeds. Well, I mean, we're all human. Yeah, I mean we. I don't know, I mean, <laughs> I'm pretty, pretty legit, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding, that's called pride, and that's a sin, um, we'll talk, so, about, that we'll talk about that later, okay, so, but you always reap what you sow, and I believe if you start reaping bad seeds, and you start hanging around with bad people, like, bad crowds that are pulling you away, it can actually not, it, it can pull you away from your purpose, because how are you ever supposed to get to the place God wants you if you're not being influenced or pushed to get to that place? Um, it's kind of like a GPS system. If I don't put in the destination, how am I ever going to get there? Like, so how important is it, do you think, to have friends? Because obviously, like, if you guys don't know, Mariah is one of the people that if, like, I'm going through something, I call her, I call Nate, and I'm like, listen, this is what's going on. I need help. I need prayer. What do we do? And they are the people that point me in the right direction, but how important is it to have the right group of people that are pointing in the right direction that say, hey, you have a purpose, don't waste this? I mean, that's everything, honestly. Oh. Like, I mean, I grew up with the saying, birds of a feather flock together, mm. and... <laughs> <You're winning. laughs> and I mean, like, and that you're going to be, like, if you're influenced, you're going to draw the wrong attention, and you're going to draw the wrong crowd, and that's not what we're called to do. We're called to stand apart. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to shine a light. And whenever we're influenced, we have these voices that creep into our heads. Mm -hmm. And it is just, it makes us lose focus of what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. So one of the things that me and her wanted to talk to you about too, I think there's some key things we need to talk about in order to kind of understand what purpose is and how do you discover your purpose. And one of them was the concept of grace. Um, so if you're taking notes, the concept of grace um, is really, I think, I, I mean, I was telling you about this earlier too. That's something that I still, I've been raised in church my whole life, but I'm still every day learning something new about grace. Like I'm still in the process of it. Um, and one of the things I think I told you was, is like, remember one of the biggest things I'm actually was having a hard time with was, uh, I, I was raised in a strict home. Anyone raised in a strict home? Like, really strict? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Both hands. <laughs> Both hands and a foot. Um, so I was raised in a strict home, but I don't know if anyone else can relate to this, but this was how my home life was. If you did something wrong, I'm going to let you know. And if you did something wrong, I'm going to forgive you, but I'm also going to hold it over your head. Like, I'm going to remind you that you did this. And I want to say something real quick. I think that's a bad, there's a bad representation of how I view God forgiving me. Because God doesn't just forgive you. He forgives you and chooses not to remember. He says at the moment that you confess it, I'm already casting it as far as the east is from the west. And that's the concept of grace. Has there ever been a time in your own life where it was hard to accept grace for like yourself or for somebody else? <laughs> yeah, I got you on that one. Bah! Like, yeah, we slammed up, girl. <laughs> Drop the question. <laughs> um, I think if you don't struggle with it, then, I mean, I don't want to say you've become maybe callous to it. Ooh. Like, you always want to feel it. You always want to be aware of it. And whether it's on you or it's on somebody else. Like, I mean... <laughs> I think I think the one thing we often misunderstand though is that grace is a free gift. I think that's the thing we often forget is grace is a free gift. Yeah. I mean, I think we all we just feel like as like human beings, we feel like we have to work for something mm. in order to receive something. 
And I mean, in a way, you do have to work for it. You have to live right and make good choices and all that. But like, this is just a free gift that he gives us, and we make it complicated. Right. By us working for it, it's not. We're not working hard and doing all these good things to get grace. Grace is already given to us. Uh, I loved how um, one of my favorite pastors put it this way. It's it's very because it's kind of hard to understand that. So grace is not a get out of jail free card. Like how many of y'all played Monopoly? Okay, so you know if you go to jail, you have this thing that's called a saving grace. In my opinion, that's called a get out of jail free card. Okay, if you have this card, you don't have to stay in jail. Like you get out. But a lot of times we take grace as if it's a get out of jail free card. Well, since grace is there, since God's forgiveness is there. Therefore, I don't have to repent. I don't have to live right because grace is always there. But here's the thing I would I want to push, and I hope I can I hope I can do this, and I hope you're with me. Here's how a pastor worded one day. That's basically saying I love my wife, but I can cheat on her because it's okay. She'll forgive me. That's tough. And yet we do this with God. <laughs> she went cute, <laughs> like, but. This is exactly what we do with God. We say, oh, it's okay because there's grace. There's forgiveness. But that's not true love. If you really love somebody, you're not going to try to hurt them. You want to do everything you can to prevent hurting them. Why do we feel that it's necessary to put the nails back in Jesus' hands? I mean, let's be real. Like, if we, say, we say, oh, I got grace. I got grace, Pastor Chris. I, I don't need to repent. Okay. So what you're basically telling Jesus is, yeah, you can go back to the cross and do what you did all over again. Because I need more, as if the cross wasn't enough. And I just, and I think that's the bad mis, like, misunderstanding we have in grace, is that it's not a get out of jail free card. It's not I can continue to live the way I want to. Grace, when we find grace, it changes us. It's supposed to say, I don't want to live this way anymore. I'm called to something higher. I'm called to walk in holiness. I'm called to walk in, in what God has called me to. Um, and I know I'm, I, I haven't been perfect with grace either. I, I, I remember times where I was like, man, God's forgiveness is there. But once I've truly started to follow Jesus and understand what real, genuine grace is, grace started to change me. I started to say, man, I don't want to do these things anymore. Like, God's so awesome. You get a conviction. Hmm. And, there's, and that's the thing, is I think there's a difference between conviction and guilt and shame. So conviction, for y'all that don't know, I think there's a huge difference. There is a huge difference. Do you want to explain what that is? Cause... I mean, you probably explain that. <laughs> so conviction, conviction, I hope you know, like, there's a difference between guilt and shame. And conviction. Like, there's a difference. Guilt and shame, go to, they hold hands. They go together. Here's, here's how I'll explain it. Jesus said... To the woman who committed adultery. I mean, in the very act. He said, where is your accusers? And she said, no, there's no accusers. He says, now go and sin no more. What Jesus is ultimately telling us is, yes, you're going to make a mistake, but you don't have to keep living in that mistake. You can draw a line. You can get up and walk away from it and make a choice. So the concept is this, though. When you do fall and make a mistake, there's grace. But if you start feeling... This saying like, man, I'm terrible. I'm never going to reach anything. Do you know that's exactly what Satan wants you to feel like? That's how he communicates. God does it this way. Hey, what you did was wrong, but let's walk away from it. Go and sin no more. Let's, let's clean the slate. Guilt and shame hold you, like, hold you hostage. Grace sets you free. So grace really is not a get out of jail free card. It's a free gift given to us that when we mess up, we can come and give God our worries, our doubts, our fears, and say, God, I'm sorry I did this. I need to lay this down. Because guilt and shame, is, I just believe strongly it's not from God. I, I just strongly believe it because even the scripture says, therefore there is no now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no more guilt and shame. It's just conviction. Conviction is a great thing. We need conviction. But guilt and shame is entirely something else. That keeps you there. Jesus says, let's learn from this. Let's walk in this. Let's get out of this. So that was something I know that we talked about too. And I think that's a good point. Um, I think that's a good point. Um, 
And I mean, I feel like the conviction is kind of like also like the Holy Spirit. That's how He talks to us. Absolutely. He's like that, like pit in your stomach. That like something that like, mm, that might not be right. That might not be the best decision. Yeah. Like he, that is God, the Holy Spirit, trying to not make you make the decision, but giving you a choice. Be like, hey, this is not the best decision, but I'm gonna let you choose it anyways because He gives us free will to do whatever we want. Right. So once we understand the concept of grace, here's the other thing that we talked about. And we're going to hit hard on this. They don't even know. The next thing comes is humility. Humility. I don't... I'm trying. I'm trying so hard. <laughs> okay. I think humility is something that we lack in a lot of. And I think it's, it's something because we don't get a true understanding of what it is. In the sense of like, what does it mean to be and like humility, to have humility. Um, what would you say to someone if they said, hey, what does it really mean to walk in humility? What does it mean to have humility? I mean, humility is like not being self-absorbed, not making it all about the me show, it all about me, my, what I've accomplished, what I've done, what I'm doing. It's asking how your friend is in class that you know is going through something. It's being that confidant that someone can trust and come to you and know it's a safe place. It's living just a humble life. Do you think someone has to be perfect? Absolutely not. Okay. Because I, I would say I would say it's not living by perfection, mm-hmm. but you're living by grace. That's what it means. So I'm not choosing to be perfect because I know I'm not, but I'm going to strive for perfection. Remember Paul talks about that Read that in the scripture where he says, I'm striving for perfection. I'm striving for the end goal. So it, the concept of grace is not saying, I have to be perfect. I can't make a mistake. I, I'm, 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 I'm going to be doing so much wrong things if I, if I don't do this. But it's understanding, like, listen, I, I have weaknesses. But I'm going to choose to walk confidently in God's made me. Therefore, I can overcome my weaknesses. Uh, today in chapel, I talked about, Paul talks about boasting about your weaknesses so that Christ remains strong within you. Um, and I think that's what humility is. It's saying, listen, I have weaknesses, but Christ still chose me. Like, man, have made, man may have rejected me. My dad may have rejected me. My parents, my, that boyfriend and girlfriend may have rejected me. But I was still selected by God. I'm still chosen. I still have a purpose. Um, so, you, so you said you don't think any, like, it, it's, not a, it's not a thing of being perfect. But it's a thing of striving for perfection. It's a thing of saying, I'm going to try to do my best every single day. Yeah, I mean, I think we all should strive to be perfect. We should all strive to be the best that we are supposed to be because that's how God created us. God didn't create us to be mediocre. It didn't choose to just, you know, get handed, have handouts and all that stuff, which, I mean, sometimes it's nice to get handed. <laughs> but... Like for your play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it's... He gave us a strong work ethic. He gave us drive and focus to to accomplish what he has built us to be and to do and to accomplish. You know what I think is affecting our humility, though? And it's the next thing that we said we were going to talk about, and that's that we're no longer content Mm -hmm. because of social media. I honestly believe it. We are, I, think, I think social media has now took away us being, like, in our humility, and it's took away us being content. Because think about it. You go on Instagram, and you're seeing people's highlights. You're seeing the best parts of their life. Do you know how many, people, how many pictures they took to get that picture? <laughs> their parents, it's not even perfect. Like, oh, yeah, no, not that they had to take 20 of them and just, like, scroll them. <laughs> and put a filter on it. And, and what's sad about it is, is this is oftentimes I feel what's been creating anxiety. Is I feel like social media has this way of saying I'm not where I need to be. Look at what this person is doing. Therefore, I must be doing something wrong. But that's a whole lot. Like, okay. So like honestly, social media is a great tool. I think you can. I think you can use it for the gospel, reaching people. It's a yeah. It's, Absolutely, it's a platform. It's totally a platform. But like every good thing, there's a con to it. And I feel like social media has not gave us, it's, it's almost given us validation. So like, 
You were saying something to me yesterday. What was the, yeah. guys, you want to write down this quote. I dropped my phone and almost cracked it because of this. Listen to what she came up with when we were on the phone. Tell her what you came up with. Oh, I said, you are made in God's image. So why would we put a filter on God's handcrafted creation? I felt the victim of that too. I had to delete my Instagram. <laughs> like, I got too many filters. <laughs> But what you're actually saying is, like, why try to pretend to be somebody else when God's already made you so special? Like, you, you're an original. You're, he, did, he made you an original. You're not a copy. You're not supposed to be like the person next to you. You're not supposed to be like all these people that we follow and look up to. When in reality, those people that you look up to might be looking up to you. Oh, come on. But yet, we're putting on a mask. We're putting on a facade. And they would just want to—they want to see us for who we are. Mm. That's so good because this—this this idea too is. I wonder if if Jesus had like let's just say Jesus had social media. I'm pretty sure if Jesus did, I'm pretty sure he would have his social media promoting other people and never promoting himself. Because the, oftentimes I see Jesus's main focus. Is his mission, and it was to impact people. And a lot of times we use social media to show how good we are doing, not to show how someone else is doing. Uh, and I feel like that's a bad habit to get into, because that's when we're actually stepping away from humility. That's when we're like saying, like, we're like, it's all about me, so now I'm going to now step back into humility. But when we say, I don't want to be that guy, I'm, stepping, I'm taking a step back from humility. I think one of the other things that we said too was, um, Everyone is trying to be somebody they're not on social media. And it's just you. Nobody else has to know. It's your social media. Don't, that, that picture you posted, the person doesn't know what you're actually going through on the other side of that phone. All they see is what you posted, what you want people to see. And oftentimes we use it just to promote ourselves. I mean, like, I'm guilty of this. <laughs> No, seriously. And you shut down your own <laughs> No, but like, how many times are we Snapchatting and all that stuff, taking a selfie, like, bomb selfie, good lighting, you know, highlighter on fleek, like, all that stuff. And we take, a, we take a Snapchat, we take a selfie, and as soon as you smile, you're like, smile, and then you're like, yeah. like, completely, like, <laughs> you're not wrong. You're not right. happy. <laughs> like, you just, like, smile, like, People watch, like, it's so bad. People watch me do that. And they're like, are you serious? <laughs> I'm like, what? They're like, dude, I need to record your face. Like, <laughs> do you think you took something? If you would? Yes. Yes. <laughs> he said yes. I don't know. Cause, like, I don't know if you would be so <laughs> absorbed in that. Let's get some people who, like, let's get some theologians and ask them, if Jesus was here, would he take a selfie? I, I would love to hear that answer. Um, so one of the other questions we have submitted um, and I think it's an important one. I think it's the one that most people struggle with. And it's, how do you know when you found your purpose? I think this is the most, like, how many of you are saying, that's what I'm struggling with right now. I don't know if I, like, how to identify if I found my purpose. See, like, we got most people in here, like, I don't know what that's even going to look like. Um, what would you say to this question? How would you answer this? You don't feel anxious, you don't feel like, you don't doubt it, you just like know that you know that you know that, like, yeah, I feel good about that. Yeah, yeah, I have to agree. I think, I think seeking after peace is a big important factor. Uh, when I accepted this job uh, to be the youth pastor here, I felt nothing but peace. And it wasn't just, it, there's a difference between like, Peace, like, oh, you're listening to oceans, and you're, you're, you're like, feeling the wind, and it makes you feel peace. <laughs> yeah. There's a different kind of peace when it's a God-given peace. It sinks deeper. It's a more, like, it's, it, it hits harder. It's just the feeling of, like, wow, I feel great. I feel so at peace right now. I feel so at joy right now. Um, 
So when, I would say always look after peace. I think you're right. I think finding peace is a big, important thing to know that you're walking to your purpose. What would, what would be another thing, though, that we could give on something when you know you're walking into your purpose? Um, it's just everything in your life where it's going to seem like it's just lining up, like things just like fall into place. But at the same time, you have to understand that life is not always going to be easy. It's mm. not always going to be, you know, everything put together, tied up in a bow, and presented to you on a platter. Like, things are going to be difficult. Things are going to get hard. And that's when we have to, you know, buckle down and, yeah. like, pray. And we need to seek. We need to be confident into knowing that this is what we're supposed to do. Yeah. Because, I mean, we're going to be conflicted. And that's just human nature. Like, we're going to doubt, we're going to second yes, but at the same time, you have to be confident in who you are in Christ, and you have to be confident in the decision and where he's leading you. Yeah, that's really good. I think, I think to add on top of that is that, like, I hope you know, like, purpose isn't just, like, finding your purpose in ministry. It doesn't have to be ministry. I think, I think your purpose involves some kind of ministry. I think maybe you're, maybe you're supposed to be a nurse because maybe before a person is about to go into surgery, maybe you're supposed to pray with that person and witness them to Jesus. I mean, you can, you can show Jesus in any career you want. It's just how effectively are you going to do it? Um, it doesn't have to be, I need to be the next worship leader. I need to be the next pastor. Like, that's not the purpose we're talking about. We're talking about what has God gifted you in that he wants to use through you? Like, what is your gifts and talents that God wants to use for his glory? That's your purpose. That's what you've been sent here to do. Um, I think one of the things that you were saying, too, is it's like just that feeling of like, yeah, this is why I'm here. Like, this is the reason why I was sent here on earth. Uh, I think for me being a pastor, I, I love what I do. And I can finally see that this is why God gave me the heart that I have because I couldn't handle it. She loves Mission, uh, mission trips, like that's her heart. That's not my heart. Like missionary kid, my heart breaks when you can't help so many people, and you see so many people that you just can't help because the city is really poor and they don't have any fresh water, and it's just really hard. So I realized that that was the pastor heart in me that I want to try to help as many people as I can. And I just remember it was just so much weight, and I was like, I can't. I'm not called there. To be but mission. then in my heart, I'm like, yeah, I'm get, I get to help the one. I get to help that one catapult them. I get to help that one prosper. I get to help that one get on track and show them and all that. So then that's like the difference. Like, like oh, no, I can't handle all these people. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the one. Give me the three. And let me like mentor. Let me speak into them. Let me help them yeah. the best way that I can. So... I'm gonna even go to the extent. I'm not gonna get. I'm probably gonna get some people upset by saying this, but I actually, I think it's the truth. I think walking to your purpose isn't gonna be easy. I think if you face difficulty, you're exactly where God wants you to be. Absolutely. I think. I think with walking your purpose, you will face criticism. Okay. The, the reason why I say this is look in the scripture. Jesus gets criticized for every little thing he does. By people who claim to be Christians. Because criticism isn't a resistance of purpose, but an engagement of purpose. It's not pushing you away from your purpose, it's engaging your purpose. Jesus oftentimes faced criticism. So I feel like if you are walking into your purpose and you're getting criticized for